Hi everyone, welcome. This week we are going to be looking at interpersonal and group workplace conflict. So we already talked about interpersonal and small groups and different things like that. So now what we're going to be looking at with this is how to handle the conflict within those groups or relationships and different things like that. There's some different tactics, some different communication styles that you can do, and different ways that you can handle them. But before we do that, we need to kind of learn the basics and then we can get to the very tactics at the end and things to do and not to do. So let's go ahead and get started. First, the inter this conflict, the interpersonal or a small group conflict, a lot of times it's due to an interpersonal conflict. It might be within a small group, but it really has to do with one to one person, but it might be in the group as a whole. But it's because people are interdependent, meaning we need each other to do stuff, but yet we don't need each other to do stuff. Okay? Now when I say that, I know it sounds very counterproductive, but we have our own opinions, we have our own thoughts, but we can't do everything by ourselves. So we have relationships that do that. We learn that in interpersonal. We also make groups to solve for committees and problems and different things like that. Because of these relationships and these groups, we're needing each other. But due to our own opinions, we might feel like our opinion and someone else's opinion are not equal, which is where conflict starts occurring. So we're aware that we are incompatible. Our goals are not where we should. Our ideas are not e exact, which is good because you don't want to just have yes men because that goes to group thing, which is what we discussed a couple lessons ago. And then the big issue, because group thing is bad, but if you see someone and say, hey, I, I don't see your idea being fully correct, let's discuss it. That's better than saying, no, my idea is better than yours. So when people perceive each other as inferior, that's when the conflict happens. So yes, these two build up to it, but if you have different ideas, different thoughts, and you handle it differently, then that's going to be good because you're having a good discussion. That's a good type of conflict. But the bad conflict is when you think that you are better than the other or vice versa. Now, as we move on, there are different levels of communication, different levels of conflict. So we have two different ideas. That's why we have a graph. Okay, so low, high, low, high. So when we look, our first one is going to be the interdependency and then the depth and breadth of conflict, meaning what is the conflict? What is the meaning of the conflict? And how much do you work with this person and how much do you actually do with this person and need that person? So what this chart is saying is if the conflict isn't that much and you really don't do a lot with that person, it's really going to be nothing. But if you do a lot, if you have a lot of interdependency with that person and you have, it's a very deep conflict, like a big, big topic issue, then it's going to be very hot. Okay? Now, of course, there's always going to be ones that it can be a very high conflict, but you barely work with that person, so it's going to be over here. But if you know what a scatter plot is, which is something everyone learned in grade school, then we're going to, of course, have all these scatter plots like this. But when we have most of them fit around this to show that it's a po um, positive correlation. Now, as we move forward, we need to know that online conflict does occur. And this is called flaming. So flaming is when you are personally messaging someone and you're personally attacking them through online messaging, okay? Junk mail is a version of flaming, okay? As Donna said uh, off of Parks and Rec, if you don't like what I post, just don't follow me. Well, if that worked in the whole world and that's how the world works, a lot of our conflicts would be gone. But a lot of politicians could fall into flaming, especially politicians today. We use Twitter, we use Instagram, and different things like that to express our opinions, but we also use it to attack other people, and that's called flaming, because it is a style of conflict, but it's just online, because a lot of times, the only way that person can rebuttal is through another tweet or another post, and then it just goes back and forth, and there's not as much as the communication process, because it's the fifth level of communication, which is mass, which has little to no feedback. Now, as we move forward, conflict can occur in both a context and a relationship. So we're going to look at both. So a context conflict, it's centered over an object, over a person, over an issue or something like that. So a person, okay? I'm going to use the example of Friends. If you watch Friends, you know that Ross and Rachel are on and off, on and off again. And the big issue was that they were on a break or they weren't on a break, depending where you were. But you can say the context conflict was centered around the person in between Ross and Rachel. So the person that Ross ended up sleeping with when he thought they were on a break. 
Okay, I'm not spoiling anything. If you haven't seen it by now, I'm sorry. Okay, and then, but you could also argue that a relationship conflict is a conflict that doesn't necessarily mean around the conflict itself, around a person, an object, an event, something like that. But instead, it's over a relationship. So it's an idea of something. Okay, so you can have a conflict with someone in within the relationship. Okay, just like this, they had a conflict with the ex with. Ross and Rachel, they just had an issue within their relationship. So there's a relationship conflict. Another example of this could be if you are married or you have a significant other, that you could say you're arguing over each other, you're arguing each other, and it could be you didn't into the dishwasher. Okay, so the context is you did not into the dishwasher. But then as you go on, you could easily find that it's more relationship conflict where you're actually having issues with that person and what you're doing. Okay, but it's not centering around a certain thing, it's just kind of centering around the whole idea of that relationship. Okay. Now, as we move forward, we want to make sure that you understand that conflict can be both negative and positive. We're going to look at those aspects first. So let's start with negative. So negative conflict, it increases the reward, or sorry, <laughs> increases negative rewards for the opponent. Okay, and then also can close yourself off. So if conflict is negative, the reward is not that high. Okay. Meaning, there's a theory called social exchange theory. So, with social exchange theory, it talks about rewards and it talks about the cost and different things like that. Okay, what it's saying is that the cost of it that as long as it costs something is worth the reward, you're going to do it. So, an example for social learning theory would be that you have a friend and they ran out of gas and they're two hours away. So, they call you and say, "Hey, I ran out of gas." Could you come give me some gas and bring it to me? Now you're going to look at it and say, okay, the cost would be driving to that friend to get them gas. So is the reward, so it's the reward minus cost equal to outcome. That's the formula for social learning theory. Reward, sorry, social exchange theory. Reward minus cost equals outcome. Now with that, the cost of driving there and bringing them gas, is the reward of their friendship worth the outcome? If it is, you're going to do it. It's going to be positive. But if not, it's going to be negative. And more than likely, the relationship's not going to do well. But if you're also just attacking a person, it can close the other person off and they don't want to, want to ever talk to you or say anything to you again because they're super nervous about what's going to happen or different things like that. And they might not be able to express their full opinion because they have closed themselves off. Now, to flip that, it also can be positive. So with that, we're looking at how it could understand issues that should have been understood. So if you approach it the right, right way and people don't close themselves off like in negative, it talks about how people can understand ideas, concepts, and they might not even know they do it. I'm a very loud chip eater, and when I eat chips, it's like <laughs> But with every other food, I'm not that loud. But my wife always points it out, and that's something I honestly did not know until we started dating. And she pointed it out, so that could have easily been a conflict, but it was just an issue that needed to be looked at. And yes, I'm still a loud chip leader because I don't know how to be a quiet chip leader. Okay? But with that, looking at social exchange theory, is the reward, the reward of that relationship high enough to have the cost of the conflict? If it is, it's going to have a good outcome. Okay, that's going to be your reward. Okay, and that's going to be the outcome. Meaning, if you're going to come out with a negative and it, the cost of it is so high that it outweighs the reward and it's going to come out to be like a negative number, then that relationship, that conflict is probably not worth having, but is that relationship worth having too? Okay? So if that relationship's worth having, then should you actually say it because it might break the relationship. And as we move forward, context place, takes place in many different things. The physical, the location. Where should you do it? Conflict should always happen in private, except if it's a, like a death is what I call it. So a death would mean something like a breakup. You're telling someone that someone died, different things like that, because especially breakups, they always need to happen in a public setting. Now with that, the reason is because at a death moment is when they are, so it's the death of a relationship, the death of a person, death of an animal or whatever it is, they're at a critical point where you actually don't know how they're going to react. Because if you've never broken up with that person, they could be the best person in the world, and all of a sudden they could hit a switch, and they could flip out on you. So deaths need to happen in public. Now realize, if you have been married for 
you know, 10 years or however long in, you find out that your in-law has passed away, that's something that's different, okay? You don't, don't do that in public. Now, when I say death, I'm mainly focusing on the death of a relationship, because that's what we're talking about, conflict within relationships, okay? Now, there's also the um, sociology, socio, um, mm, context that we're looking at. Meaning equality, you need to understand when you enter that relationship, you're going to say, okay, we're about to have a conflict within the relationship, but I'm going to listen to you, you're going to listen to me. We're both at equal level playing field. You're not going to say, I'm better than you, so sit down and listen to what I'm telling you. Because if that happens, the re outcome of the social exchange theory that we're talking about is then going to be negative, and it might break the relationship, or you might lose something, and it might have more negative outcomes. So make sure you go into the, into the conflict with equal mindset, okay? And then also look at how they're feeling. Again, let's look at having the dishwasher empty. When my wife comes home and she didn't enter the dishwasher and she walks through the door and she says, oh my gosh, I have had the worst day in my life. I'm not gonna slam the dishwasher shut and be like, well good, because it's about to get worse, because you didn't empty this dishwasher, okay? You need to figure out when is the right time? How are they feeling? Where, where's the right location, okay? And you also need to know about the person's background. Were they abused as a child? Did they get injured, different things like that? You need to talk about that. You need to figure out how does that affect that person, okay? If it is, then maybe they're gonna be terrified and start yelling at them, different things like that. Okay, when you're looking at conflict, you need to understand that conflict has five different styles we're going to be looking at. The first is the competing, meaning I'm fighting in this conflict to win. I win, you lose. We're going to finish, and I'm going to win, and you're going to lose. Then there's also the avoidance. I lose, you lose, because let's not talk about it. If it's a conflict, and I don't want to talk about it, you don't want to talk about it, let's just not talk about it. So we both lose, because we're not growing as people. We're not understanding how we talk about the positive outlook of conflict could lead to positive items. We're not getting that, because you're just avoiding it in general. And then you have accommodating, which is I lose, and you win. So a lot of times, these two go together. So if someone comes and says, hey, I have issues, and you're like, oh, okay, I'm sorry, I'll check this out. Oh, I'm sorry, I'll check this out. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'll check this out. Okay, no, everyone has something to fix. Just because you're the person who has the main issue doesn't mean that you have to be, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Both of you have stuff that you can work on, okay? So don't be that person who's saying, I'll fix that, I'll fix that, I'll fix that. Because it could easily be that person maybe needs to fix the way they look at life, okay? And then collaborating, which is the goal, which hardly ever happens, but it's I win and you win, which is what everyone wants. But the one that works best with this is the compromising. I win a little bit and I lose a little bit. You win a little bit and you lose a little bit. Meaning, I'm going to give and take, I'm going to get some stuff, I'm going to have an issue, I'm going to get some stuff from the conflict, but I'm also going to make sure you're getting stuff from the conflict, which in essence means I'm not going to win all of it. But you're kind of getting both. This is the one that everyone strives for. Now again, everyone wants the collaborating where you both win, but that hardly ever happens, unless you're looking at you know, nature and there's a lot of things that happen within that, like fish and then fish and then anemone, okay, different things like that. Now, when you go into a conflict, we already discussed a little bit of this, but you don't just want to go in hot headed. You want to make sure that you're trying to fight in private. Again, unless you are fighting and you are trying to do a breakup, then you want to do a breakup in public. Okay, you want to make sure it's everyone ready. This goes back to the dishwasher example. Don't don't just catch someone off guard to make sure you win because we want to collaborate. We don't want to compete, which is the two styles we just talked about. Okay, and then you want to make sure that you're fighting to resolve issues and not just to fight. Because some people just like to fight. Don't be that person. Okay, all throughout you want to make sure you're reexamining your brief. Do I really think that? Yes. Okay, am I able to change on that? Yeah, I think I'm able to change on. No, I'm really gonna hold firm on that one. Okay, constantly you're checking, what do I believe? Remember we discussed beliefs, okay? Now, in a conflict, you wanna make sure that you are doing a couple different things. Why are you fighting? Know the goal. Are you fighting just to fight because that's not a good reason? Know the goal. You're fighting because that person never does this and you would like them to understand how you feel and maybe they could start doing it, okay? If that's what it is, you need to make sure that you go in for that goal, not just, okay, this is my goal, and now I'm going to pull this in and pull this in, okay? Know the one main item. Just like our thesis statement, how a thesis, everything tied back to the thesis, everything needs to tie back to your main goal of the conflict. Now, emotional state, state. 
You want to make sure that the status of the person with their emotions is constantly okay. Yes, some people cry a lot. Some people are natural criers and different things like that. But you want to make sure that when you look at this person and when you actually discuss and do different things like that, that you're, they're not at a breaking point where you just need to say, okay, let's pause and let's come back to this. So sometimes that needs to happen. But if everyone's still constantly okay, you can finish the argument in one sitting and make sure everything's okay. But sometimes it's, you know what, we're going to be done for now. Let's watch a movie. Let's put this on pause and come back to it. Okay? And then you want to make sure that people are ready. They're not trying to compete with each other to try to win. You want to make sure that you understand their family history. Again, this goes back to were they abused as a child? Were they unsure how to do this? Were they not understanding this? Do they have the idea of this? How did their family act? Okay, so for my family, we're very loud people. So my wife understands that. She looks, and that's really something hard for me to turn off because I'm just a out there person. And when she met my whole family, my mom and her sisters and my sister and everyone, they're just very out there like I am. And my wife's family is very reserved, very held back. They all are at their house and they're very quiet when they eat dinner and different things like that. So that was something we both got adjusted to. But when we argue and different things like that, we understand that we argue differently. And we're not going to say, no, you need to get loud because my family doesn't get loud. We understand how they are. And she gets loud at points, and I try to get quiet at points because that's how we're used to doing it, and that's the best outcome. Okay? Or works for the best outcome. Now, you need to know the person and know their personality. If you're by yourself in Cooper, know that you have to think more, you can't think of theoretical, you have to think more literal. Okay? Now, after a conflict, you want to make sure that is there anything that we still need to do? Are we done with the conflict? Did we solve the issue we saw, wanted to solve? And then you have to learn from it. You're actually going to find, you're like, okay, we're going to move on. You have to say, we're going to actually adjust and try to do stuff. And then resolve the negative feelings. If you call someone a B word, you need to make sure you're sorry. Unless you really miss it, then that's something else we want to work on. But if you said some things you didn't mean to say, you need to quickly resolve that. And just still make sure that person knows that you care for them and that you actually are appreciative of that relationship. And then you want to see, did this increase the exchange of the reward? Back to social exchange theory. Was it worth it? At the end, if it had a negative outcome, you might want to look and re-examine your beliefs and say, you know what? This relationship's not worth it. And cut the cord off. Okay? Now, these last two slides are going to talk about different strategies. So we're going to kind of go through these fast, but here are some different ideas that you should and should not do when you're working with conflict. So first, avoidance. We already talked about that. A lot of times, stereotypical in the US, this happens with men more than women, but what happens is you have someone and you're arguing an alternative. I'm done, and they just walk out because they're so angry. They don't want to fight. They don't want to do that. They would rather just watch football or watch dancing, whatever you're into, right? Okay, but this is an awful way because you're not getting it done. This goes back to the five conflict styles we have. You're avoiding it, so you're not getting it done. Especially in the middle of the argument, you need to decide. You need to actually state, okay, I'm deciding I think we need to pause and come back to it. And then hopefully the other person says, okay, let's come back to it. But you can't just say, no, I'm done, and walk out. Because that's going to lead to more conflict. Okay? And then the next one is non-negotiating. You're the person sitting there and you're saying, nope, mm -mm, I don't do that. Nope, I don't care. Whatever. Nope, nope. Because like we talked about, the communication process is a circle. But with non-negotiating people, that one person's trying to give the message and the only feedback is nope, nope, nope. So it's not a constant circle. Just like a conflict in a conversation needs to be a circle, just like the communication process. Okay? So the non-negotiated people, make sure you say, I understand where you're coming from, and different things like that. And then force is when you're trying to win at an argument. So you are using coercion power, which is what we discussed when we talked about leadership powers, but you're using physical force and threats to try to get the person to do what you want them to do. And then blame the whole time you're saying, no, I didn't do that. That's you. Oh, no. I wouldn't do that if you didn't do this. Oh, okay, yes, I do do that. But it's because you do this. When I do that, you're doing this, which makes me mad. So constantly, yeah, I, I might take a little blame for it, but basically everything I'm doing wrong, it's because of something you're doing wrong. And it's constant. You, you, you were doing something wrong. Okay? So this one is constantly putting blame onto them, and this one's saying, nope, 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 nope. I'm not listening. Or is this one saying, no, I don't do that. If I do, it's because of you. Okay? And then empathy is something we want to have. So there's a difference between sympathy and empathy. 
Okay, so empathy is when you actually are feeling for another person. Sympathy is when you're like, okay, I understand how you are, you know, I see what you are doing. I can see that you're in pain. I'm sorry. But empathy is you're actually there. You're like, I feel for you. Like, I've been through that. I'm actually feeling the same emotion you've been through. Versus sympathy, where it's like, I see you're in pain. I get that you're in pain, but you can't actually feel the same pain that they've been feeling. Okay? Which is good. You want to be able to make sure you're feeling the same pain as them. And then gunny sacking. This is something that a lot of people use. So gunny sacking is a gunny sack is when you have every single conflict in a bag. So it's a big bag. Think of like Santa Claus or Mary Poppins, right? Everything coming out of the bag. And then all of a sudden someone comes and they say, hey, I have this issue with you. And you're like, oh yeah, well, you didn't do this. And you didn't do this. And you didn't do this last weekend, last year. And five days ago, you didn't do this. And two years ago, five days, three hours, you didn't do this. Okay, you're throwing it all out at once. Let's go back to the idea we talked about earlier, focusing on the goal. Everything in that gunny sack, if you had an issue with it, it should be resolved a long time ago. Okay, if not, if it's no longer going to be resolved, let it go. Okay, listen to Elsa off of Frozen and let it go. Okay, but do not dump everything out at once unless it actually has something to do with that goal that you have. If not, it's gone unless you bring it up later in a different argument. And then manipulation is when you're avoiding the conversation, okay, but you're not trying to have an open, you're not fully avoiding, but you're avoiding an open conflict where you're like, oh, well, let's do this, and you're trying to just tiptoe around it to get what you want, and in the end, you actually didn't discuss the conflict, you just were keeping everyone happy where you move forward, and all of a sudden, everyone's still happy, but that conflict was never actually talked about because you manipulated what was going on just to tiptoe around it. And then... You want to be spontaneous. Spontaneous is good. You don't want to, when someone's saying the issues you have, you don't want to sit there and say, can I finish this, 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 this. A lot of us do that. We're like, okay, they just said this. This is my response to that. Okay, they just said this. This is my response to that. Make sure you listen to fully what they say, and then you just respond openly. You don't plan what you're going to say as they're talking, okay? And one of the worst things to do is planning your first argument is good at most times, but a lot of times when you actually plan it, your whole speech, it's bad. But if you plan your first, like your thesis statement of the argument, say, hey, I have this issue with this, this is how I feel, different things like that, here we go. You know, and then the rest of these spontaneous, that's great. But if you plan a whole five-minute lecture on why you're mad and start the conflict that way, that's not good. Okay? And then personal rejection, everyone needs love and everyone actually deserves that. So if you're going to withhold love, you need to make sure it's not something you normally give. So if you are married and you give your significant other a kiss and a hug every day before work and you're angry at them and you just say, nope, I'm not going to do that. You still need to do that if it's an everyday thing. Now, if it's not an everyday thing, that's different. But you need to keep the love and affection that's constant and every day going. And you need to find another way to use your conflict. So in movies, they say a lot of times the woman's like, okay, if you don't fix this, we're not having sex, different things like that. That's actually bad to do because that's something that should be true in a relationship, okay? But the same thing goes with just hugging each other and saying I love you or different things like that. Or if you see your best friend every day and you're like, hey, how are you? Oh, high five. And if you don't do that because you're mad at them, then that's going to show, okay, they're angry at me. Yes, that will communicate successfully. But then it's going to be withholding that love and affection. You just need to say, hey, how are you? Okay, we need to talk. Different things like that. But still show them that normal love and affection. And then belt lining is when you're hitting below the belt. Okay, so we all know that that's not a good place to hit, but meaning you're saying things that really they cannot handle. You're throwing it out there and you're saying it because you know it will make them fall, you know it will make them fail at the conflict, and you will win. So you're saying it just to win, which again, we don't want to do because that's competing, and we don't want to compete. We want to compromise and we want to collaborate. Those are the, out of the five, those are the ones we want to do. Okay, so belt learning is hitting under the belt and saying things that people cannot handle, and you will win the argument. Okay, so make sure you don't do that. Again, here's an example from The Office. He, uh, Michael Scott's talking to Toby. So he says, what do you know about conflict resolution? Your answer to everything is to get divorced. So, belt learning. Okay, that's a great example. Now, again, for us, it's great humor. Okay? Now, when you're in a conflict, there's this big thing called the I statement. Okay? You need to use the I statement, and the I statement is using it such as, I feel this when I see this, and it makes me this. So 
something like that. So an example would be, I feel upset when I see or when I believe you doing this, and it makes me get very sad, okay? So you tell them the initial emotion, tell them what you are seeing or what you are feeling or what you are observing, okay? And then how, you're, how you are feeling overall and kind of express your opinions that way, okay? That's, I say that you always need to use that because you're putting all of it on you. Even though you're explaining why you're having issues with thin, but using I statements, that per it's going to be a less flow because you're saying, I feel this when I see this because I this. And it's showing this. They can't argue. No, you don't see that. It's like, no, I, I see that. But you can't say, you do this, 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 and that person can say, no, I don't do that. But if you say, I feel like you do this, they can say, Okay, because it's your feelings and you own it. So then they're like, okay, I need to change something. But if you're saying, you do this and this and this and this, they're going to say, no, I don't. But if you say, I see you do this and this and this, and it makes me feel hurt. So use I statements. Try to use you as much and talk about your own feelings, your own views, your own thoughts. Because all of that, they cannot argue with your thoughts and your feelings. And if they are trying to argue with it, then they're trying to manipulate it. And that's the relationship you want to kind of look at and evaluate with social exchange theory. But I statements are huge, so make sure you're using I statements. If you have any questions for this week, guys, let me know. I'm always happy to help, and I always love getting emails from y'all. Other than that, I hope you have a great week, and this semester is almost over. Bye, guys.